Ministry of Finance. And prior to his uh, this appointment, he held uh, another very important in, in appointment as the executive assistant to the deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India. And he holds a PhD degree from the London School of Economics. Uh, he is also an IAS officer. So uh, he is going to be the discussant uh, for both the papers that are to be presented today. So without further ado, uh, let us try and get uh, Professor Shapiro um, connected. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to present this early work today. Uh, Oliver and I are thrilled to have the chance to uh, show this and discuss this work with the folks at the IDC conference. I'm very sorry we can't be there in person uh, to do this, but we look forward to your questions. Uh, I want to start with just a couple of alibis. Uh, the first is that this is preliminary work, as you will see, and so a lot of the results here are based on data that we're still cleaning or is not yet complete. But there's been a tremendous amount of information that we've pulled together uh, over the course of the last uh, nine months. And I think some of the initial results are very encouraging. The second thing to say is this wouldn't be possible without the support of a great team. We had a fantastic group of RAs uh, working in Princeton, and a, a number of folks in India have helped us out, uh, including Ashish Modi and Radha Sarkar, who are there with you today, uh, and Noel Agarwal, uh, who's traveling, as well as a number of government officials who've helped us out by facilitating data sharing. And I want to start with a little bit of background on the process. So project. So the, the goal of the project is really to understand a little bit some of the efforts that have been made to connect rural India with the rest of the country. And for a long time, India has been characterized by this great division between the rural areas, which are relatively unconnected and not tied in and mainstream with the rest of society, and the urban areas where the kind of massive economic and social development that we've seen over the last 20 years have happened. And there have been a number of large-scale nationwide infrastructure programs that have been targeting these unconnected rural areas and trying to bring them in uh, and link them up with the rest of Indian society, both in terms of the RGGVY electrification program, uh, major road construction programs, the Universal Service Obligation Fund, which is bringing telecommunications subsidized into these areas, programs for drinking water and a number of other programs. And under the previous government, this set of activities was lumped under the uh, Birat Nirman program, which was funded at about $10 billion a year. And to put that in perspective, that's larger than the NREGA program, the, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which has been studied in a number of academic papers. So this is a very large uh, investment, so understanding its consequences and, and where and when what has been done is quite important. It's also a primary academic and policy relevance because uh, infrastructure development we know is one of the public investments that can have the largest impact on economic development. Right? So there have been a number of studies, many of them in India, which demonstrate that infrastructure investments can pay long-run dividends. Right? Roads, schools, canals, these things, railroads, these things pay off long after they've been put in place. Now, a lot of that work is historical. And so understanding the consequences of these uh, present programs is of great academic interest. Uh, it's also of great interest to do this in India because India has several unique characteristics that make it a fantastic place from a research perspective to study infrastructure development. So one of those things is scale, right? Hundreds of thousands of villages across India have been targeted with infrastructure programs uh, over the last uh, five to 10 years. So there's a tremendous number of observations that we can use to understand the consequences of these programs. Further, in India, a number of these programs have relied on predetermined eligibility criteria that are not particularly ad hoc, but instead rely on verifiable and kind of consistent criteria for choosing what to spend on and where and when. And what that lets us do is it creates opportunities to econometrically identify the causal impact of different programs. So that's all very encouraging and very useful. It's complemented by the fact that because of the competency of the Indian uh, state and bureaucracies, there's been really good records kept of projects and project completion details. And while it's not always collected in one place in the way we might want, it's part of what our project is intended to address, 
The fact that it's been collected enables us to understand what's been done where and to put those records together in a way that's relatively unique. The last thing that really makes India a great place to study this is that much of the implementation of these programs has been delegated out to the state governments. Right? And so what that means is that because the programs are independently administered according to objective criteria, not only do we have plausibly exogenous variation in individual programs so that we can identify their causal effect and impact on outcomes that we care about like educational attainment and economic growth, it also means that we have the potential to identify complementarities between the program. So to understand, for example, whether investments in electricity pay more or less dividends if they're accompanied by investments in roads and communications infrastructure. So there's great potential here from an academic perspective and great potential to inform policy debates in India. So what are we doing to try and uh, address those issues? Well, what we're basically doing is we're taking data that exist, that have been collected administratively by various state and central governments and, and government organizations, and we're pulling it together in one place so that scholars and analysts can use them. And this entails really two steps. Right? The first step is identifying the, the data and pulling it together uh, from various sources. The second step is matching the data to a consistent set of geographical units uh, in the census of India. And so a key contribution of what we've done is just pulling the information together in one place. And uh, it's been much harder than we expected, but as you'll see, it's paying great dividends. With the data, we're going to try and answer two basic research questions. First, what factors determine successful program completion? Right? So what is it that you have to do to get one of these programs done? Once we have that in hand, we can start to look at what the impacts of rural infrastructure provision is on socioeconomic outcomes. And in particular, we can start to look at are there complementarities between the different schemes, between different kinds of investments, and do they work differently in different political environments? Right? Because there might be conditions, necessary preconditions, for investments in roads to pay high dividends, right? or for investments in electricity to pay high dividends. So what we've done so far, and what we're going to talk about today, uh, is our analysis of two issues. Right? The first is how well the Birat Nirman programs reach their target populations. Right? Given the uh, official criteria for investment, do we in aggregate see the programs going where we would want them to go, or where the program designers wanted them to go? And second, can we say something about the characteristics of census villages or subdistricts that correlate with delays in project completion or high project costs, basically that give us indicators that in this kind of place, it's hard to complete these projects. That, of course, is important for later understanding socioeconomic impacts. Because when we go to look at outcomes, right, we need to understand not just what was done, but how hard was it to, to get that done, and what were the challenges and potential endogeneities in selection. Moreover, we can then think about bringing the data that we've created together with data collected from press reports or other sources on various kinds of political and economic outcomes. So with the remainder of the talk, uh, what I want to do is give a brief overview of some of the programs on which we're collecting data, and some of these infrastructure programs I've been talking about, and then provide a little preliminary analysis, mostly descriptive, that looks at the interaction between programs and what we've learned about the completion process and the challenges to getting projects done in rural India. So let me start with a, an overview of the data collection efforts. You know, if you, if you Google a lot of these programs, right, or you look them up online, uh, you're going to find some details and some things that might look like project data. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of scattered and spotty and not consistent. And what you're going to see is that there's, the data are not accessible in an integrated format. The details about the process of implementation are often lacking. And the, the baseline data, it's just not there, right? What was there before often is unknown. Moreover, there are lots of data integrity issues that are, that are kind of listed there. Uh, in addition, we found in the course of doing the project, that there are often additional fields in the data that are collected locally when the projects are being done, but that don't make it into the online systems. And so if you just go with what's easily downloadable on most of these programs, you actually miss out on an important part of the, the, the story. And so what we've been doing is visiting the relevant departments in Delhi and the states to collect information on the state-sponsored, on the national schemes, information on complementary state-sponsored schemes, 
and build a better understanding of the rollout process. Because in the course of conversations with people about these data and how to access them and what's in them, you inevitably learn things about the challenges to rollout and where there are small deviations from what you would expect from just reading the program documents. So with that background in mind, let me give you a view of how we're geolocating. Uh, so what, we, what we've done is uh, we've tried to geolocate wherever possible these programs to some of the 600,000 village, 600, villages uh, in India. Right? And so that's the unit at which we strive to geolocate things. It's often not possible to get that low, but wherever we can, we are. And so the first program uh, we've looked at is the Universal Service Obligation Fund. Right? And this is a program that was designed to bring telecommunications coverage to areas where commercial providers hadn't found it worthwhile to extend infrastructure. Right? And the motivation here is kind of obvious, right? There's a broad range of positive economic benefits to, com to cell phone coverage. And while there are areas that might not be worth it for providers now by subsidizing those areas, encouraging economic growth and getting people to start using their phones, they might become worth covering in the future. That was the theory. We've so far collected data on about 7,300 towers constructed under USOF phase one, uh, starting uh, in 2007. And, and this is kind of what that looks like. And as you can see, uh, you know, looking at the map, these towers have been built all over the country. Right? The construction is uh, particularly intense in some areas, but almost the entire country has been covered by USOF. So that's the first program. The second program is the RGGVY electrification program. And the idea of this program, uh, in particular the 10th plan, which is the data that we've constructed, that we've been working with so far, is to take villages that were not electrified, didn't have access to power, and provide access to power for them. Right? In subsequent phases, uh, the program has focused on intensifying electrification, so taking villages that have now been covered and extending the coverage out to different households within those villages. The critical thing about this program and a fact about it that uh, has I guess puzzled us a little bit, but is important to keep in mind, is that there's no guarantee of power being supplied over these lines. And as Brian Min and others have, have looked at, the extent to which uh, power follows the introduction of lines varies in, in important ways. And so one of the things we're going to be working on in the future is mapping the data we've constructed and, and refined on our GVGY construction to data on power provision. But just as a start, you can kind of see the distribution of these projects. So we've just highlighted here uh, in yellow all the villages that received electrification projects under the 10th plan. So that's kind of a, a, a broad view of India. Uh, to zoom in on Chhattisgarh, uh, what's, what's useful about this is if you look at the distribution of RGGVY projects in Chhattisgarh, you'll see that there are certain areas of the state that were heavily served by this program and others that were not. And those are going to turn out, as we'll see in a few minutes, to be different than the areas of the state that were served under USOF with important implications. The third program we looked at is the PMGSY Road Building Program. And this is a program that was launched in 2000, earlier than the other programs, and was designed to connect villages that met certain population criteria but were not yet connected to the national road network and bring them into connection physically with the rest of society. And since 2000, uh, 2001, when the program started, almost 350,000 kilometers of road have been built under this program. And there have been a number of state-sponsored programs that complement uh, this program. Now, this program is a really nice example of the data development challenges we face. So this is what, uh, this is what the road projects look like in Chhattisgarh. And in each, for each of the dots on this map, right, for each of the projects that we've identified here, the actual project level data typically doesn't record lat and long or position, right? It records a village name and sometimes and usually a district name or sometimes it will talk about a segment of road between two locations. And so what we've had to do is try and disambiguate all those kind of verbal text descriptions and bring them down to lat and longs that can be used in geographic information systems. And so in doing that so far we've been able to match with high confidence about 80% of the projects uh, in Chhattisgarh. But, uh, so it's a substantial portion, but it's not complete, and we're working on the remainder. 
But for a number of infrastructure programs, the data are recorded in this way. Right? They're not recorded with consistent geo-identifiers. So a big part of the challenge has been pinning that down. The fourth program we looked at and that we're collecting data on is the National, National Rural Drinking Water Program. And the idea here is simply to provide clean drinking water to villages that have not gotten it uh, before. And we've collected data on about three million projects under this program so far. Uh, we haven't started to analyze this much, but I'll note in passing that this is exactly the kind of program that's thought to have really high benefits in terms of getting people committed to the state and believing that the state can serve them because it provides a very basic need that uh, they can feel in their everyday activities. Finally, there are a set of what we call flexible infrastructure provision schemes. So these are schemes that are not administered according to national level criteria, but instead work according to state level criteria. And the most interesting of these for, for, for research purposes is the IAP, the Integrated Action Plan, which is a program that was intended to do small scale infrastructure projects that will help mainstream areas affected by left wing extremism. And the idea again is to do small economic development projects that are targeted very closely by local political officials in order to earn goodwill from the population and to address local economic problems and thereby reduce the supply of labor uh, and supply of fighters for left-wing extremists. So understanding the extent to which this program, which is designed to link political stability with economic development, is really fostering both, is of great interest to us. There's a number of other programs uh, that are listed here. Uh, the, the last thing to say about these is it's kind of, it's critical in many ways to understand where these programs are happening because one reaction state level po political officials may have when they see the big national <coughs> programs come in is that may shift their allocation of these small programs. And so if you look just at say RGGVY spending, there may be efforts at electrification through some of these schemes that are being done in response to the locations chosen for RGGVY. And so if you just look at RGGVY as the treatment on electrification, you may be missing, in a very important way, part of the actual electrification that's been going on. Right, so understanding these is very important to getting the overall picture right. So let me turn to some preliminary analysis now so you can get a feel for what can be done uh, with these data. And I want to start with an analysis of the interaction between some flagship programs. And the reason uh, this is so important is that because of the nature of the way these programs are done, there can be a number of interactions that cause problems. Right? And the first is that the lack of coordination might lead to inefficiencies in service delivery. In particular, you might have infrastructures that are complementary, that are complementary, that don't get done in the same place. And I'm going to show you that's exactly what happened with rural electrification and cell phones. There were a number of places where uh, cell phones went in, but electricity didn't follow. Right? And that's going to have implications for the sustainability of the communications infrastructure investments. Second reason to look at these interactions is that as the flexible programs are implemented in ways that address gaps in nationwide programs, that's going to introduce treatments that aren't accounted for in the data and tracking of the nationwide programs. So when we then go to try and study their impacts, we might draw incorrect inferences. The third reason is that there may be important complementarities. So I'll talk about cell phones and electrification. You might think that there would all, could also be complementarities between road building and electrification. So for example, it might be more valuable to bring power to a village so that farmers can refrigerate milk, milk products and meat products if they can then get those out to market along a decent road. So there may be these complementarities that if you study these programs in isolation, you won't pick up. So uh, you might also, though, be interested in understanding the factors that influence the rollout process. And I'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. So let's start by looking at the relationship between RGGVY and USAW, phase one, in Chhattisgarh. And what you'll notice when you throw these, these up on a map immediately is that the red dots representing USAW phase one villages don't overlap that well with the yellow dots representing RGGVY villages. So there are a number of places that received cell phones but not electricity and others that received electricity but not cell phones. 
And it turns out that there are very few places that receive both. Right? So this is just a simple cross-tabulation for the 20,308 villages in Chhattisgarh of the numbers that received RGGVY and USOP. Right? And so while 4% of the villages in the, in the state received electrification under RGGVY, and 2.7% received cellular communications support under USOP, only 38 Right, 0.2% received both. Right. Now, that might not be a problem if a lot of the places that received USOF already had, uh, already had electricity. But, as you can see in the next set of cross tabulations, that's not the case. Right. If you look at the 27 or 2800 villages in the state that did not have electricity in 2001, right, 53 of them received USOF towers, of those 53, only five received electrification. Right. So a substantial portion of the investment in USOF towers in that state went to places where there's no electricity coming from the grid. Now, that might not be a problem in principle if these were densely populated places that companies had found it worthwhile providing infrastructure in the first place. Right. But they're not. And so what's happened is often the generators are set up and the diesel is brought in and then as soon as the people from the cellular communications company leave, the local population starts taking advantage of the electricity from the generator for other purposes, starts using the diesel fuel for other purposes, and so you don't get continuous telecommunications services. Moreover, in our conversations with a number of the telecommunications companies, What's emerged as a clear trend is the idea that many of these towers subsidized by USOF won't be sustainable in the absence of electricity coming from the grid. Because running the generators is costly and maintaining them is costly and it's not worthwhile in these rural areas. So what you may end up doing as a kind of net outcome of this program is having a set of villages that receive telecommunications subsidies, have cellular coverage for a short period of time, and then see it go away. And that's a very concerning outcome, particularly given that there are political organizations in many of these areas which are motivating people to violent activity on the basis of the failure of the state to deliver services in ways that reflect a care and concern for the local population. So there, there's something to, to really be concerned about here, and one of the things we're going to look at is how bad that, what the consequences of that are. So now let me turn a little bit to what we've learned about rollout and the challenges of rollout. And I want to start with USOF. So there are a number of uh, things that we can measure for the Universal Service Obligation Fund that indicate the challenges of, uh, of completing the program. So we can look at the number of canceled towers per district. Right? We can look at the number, the average deviation between where a tower is planned and where it's ultimately built. We can also look at the days to completion of the project. Now, as you can see here, the mean days to completion is 791. It doesn't mean that it took 791 days to build the tower. Right? It takes about two days to build a cellular tower at a greenfield site. Right? What that means is that it was 791 days from the inception of the program to when the tower got built. And so what that tells you is it tells you something about how long did it take for them to get to construction in that place, given the, given the characteristics of that place. So if you plot the distribution of completion times, you'll notice that there's a long right tail. Right? In some places, it's just harder to get these projects done. And we needed to explore, we wanted to explore why. So if you look at the plot geographically, you see that the deviations from expected location cluster in places that have substantial ethnic minorities. Right? If, you, if you kind of know something about the ethnic demography of the country. And this is a fact that we can explore more effectively uh, with some regressions. So, what I want to do is, is just kind of walk through quickly what we've done here. Rather than dwell on the regressions, which can be rather uh, boring and tedious to look at, uh, we're going to show you a series of what we call added variable plots. Right? And so what these plots are is they're basically a slice through the regression plane. So on the y-axis, 
is tower density that's not explained by variables in the regression, like the proportion of the population from a scheduled tribe, proportion of the population from a scheduled caste, etc. And on the x-axis, is literacy not explained by those variables? So think about this as a way of looking at the partial correlation between literacy on the one hand and tower density on the other hand. And as you would expect, given the purposes of USOF, places where there's a smaller portion of the population that are literate get more towers, right? because literacy correlates with economic activity. So, so that's what you would expect. So the targeting is kind of going in the right places. If you then, though, start to look at the challenges to completion, you start to see a, a picture that's a little bit less encouraging. So this plot shows the deviation in terms of kilometers from where the towers were proposed. So this is the average deviation within a district between where towers were proposed and where they're ultimately built as you move across the proportion of the population coming from a scheduled tribe. And what you see here is that there's a positive relationship. So the more of the population that is from an ethnic minority, the more and further the towers are being moved from where they were supposed to be. Now this has important welfare consequences because many of these areas are fairly mountainous and rough in terms of terrain. And so small movements in the location of towers can lead to big differences in population coverage. And so there may be large welfare implications here. The next thing to look at is the relationship between the date time of completion of the project and the scheduled tribe share. And what you see is there's a very clear positive relationship between the proportion of the population coming from a, an ethnic minority and the point in time at which the tower is constructed. Now, this is something that could come from a couple of different places, right? It could be that the natural sequencing was to build in places that were more remote and had more ethnic minorities later. So that's kind of the nice version, right? The not so nice version is that these were places where the providers were more reluctant to build, and so they built there later. And it's hard to know which of those is leading to the relationship, but what's clear is that places with more ethnic minorities were served later in the process under USAF. So the third thing we can look at for USAF is the rate of cancellation of towers. Right? So this is the number of towers within each district that were planned but were not actually built. And as you can see, the rate of cancellation goes up weekly as you move across the proportion of the population coming from a scheduled tribe. So there's evidence here, at least, that it's harder to get projects done as you move up in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the, the proportion of the population coming from an ethnic minority. Now, that's kind of that's bad news. Let me show you some, some information that suggests that maybe things are being done at least according to reasonable economic incentives. So the first of these is that the rate of tower cancellation is lower where population density is higher. Right? As you can see, where the population density is fairly low on the left side of the plot, you have a number of districts where there's a large rate of cancel, large number of canceled towers. And that's reasonable if towers are more likely to be canceled where there are fewer people around to be making phone calls and thus less revenue for the providers. What's interesting, and again consistent with that story, is that as population density increases, the average distance the tower is constructed from where it was proposed to have been constructed increases. Right? And that's consistent with the idea that as the population density goes up, the number of people who are going to lay claim to any given piece of land, or who are going to oppose the pro provision of a tower in a particular point in a particular time, is going to go up. So that's kind of consistent. So the upshot of all this is that the program targeting appears to be on track and in line with what was planned by the implementers of the program. But there's some important implementation challenges that seem to correlate with the presence of ethnic minorities. And given that we know that the presence of ethnic minorities is strongly correlated in the areas where the USAF is happening with the presence of left-wing extremism, there may be some relationships there that bear investigation. Okay, so let's turn to road building. And what I want to look at with road building is the measures of project completion. And here we can think about the cost of the roads, how long it takes to complete the roads, right, from, from the start time of the program, and the density of the roads. 
and again, this is for 524 of 600 approximately districts in India, our sample of road building projects is incomplete, but we're building it out. If you look at the histogram of days to completion for road building projects, what you'll notice is that there's a long right tail. Right? Most projects are completed by 2005 or 2006, right? but there are a certain number of projects that seem to drag on dramatically. If we then plot those geospatially, and if you, you know, look at the, think about the demography of India, it looks like completion is taking longer in areas where there are substantial ethnic minority populations. Right? And that's exactly what we see when we turn to these regression results. Right? So again, I'm not going to talk too much about the regressions. They're in the slides, and there's a PDF that's going to be uh, available from IGC. What I want to do is start by just looking at some more of those partial residual plots. So now we're looking at the density of roads constructed under PMGSY as a function of population density. Right? And the relationship is that there are more roads built in more densely populated districts. Now, it's important to note this is the opposite of the relationship for the USOP program. Right? Remember, tower density, uh, the density of towers constructed with USOP funding is higher in low population density areas. Right? But the road dense construction density is higher in more densely populated areas. Now, we believe this reflects a difference in baseline coverage. Right? At the start of the program, Telecom coverage was already quite good in dense places because the private providers had done it. However, given the road building criteria for the program, there were a large number of unconnected but heavily populated areas which PMGSY could target, and that seems to be what they did. Now, if you then turn to look at the relationship between literacy and road density constructed again, you see the kind of targeting that seems to have been going on with USOP, right? Places with less literacy, places where there were more poor people, were where there was more spent on road construction, right? And that's, again, that's, that's what we should expect. That's the way the program was designed. It doesn't look uh, like there's a strong relationship between scheduled tribe membership and days to completion under PMGSY, although it is positive, and in the same direction as with USA. So again, there's something about these areas that either put them later on the prioritization list or make them harder places to work. Finally, we can look at the cost per kilometer of road construction. And we see that that's positively related with population density. Now, that makes a ton of sense, right? Where there are more people, it should be more costly to acquire land. Wages might be higher. There are a number of things that would affect costs. But if the completion rates were about cost structures, and if population is correlated negatively with scheduled tribe membership, as we know it is, you would expect that we would have seen the opposite in the previous panels, right? You would have seen that there would not be a strong uh, relationship. And so what that makes us think is that, as with USOP, there are multiple areas that make it harder to work in areas with high scheduled trust, tribe populations, right? It's not that they're more costly places to build, right? There's something else going on. And we think that something else might be left-wing extremism, although we have to investigate that much more, obviously. So let me kind of wrap things up so that we can move on to, to Q&A, because you've probably seen enough of me talking on video by now. Uh, there were at least four ambitious nationwide programs, infrastructure programs, that can be mapped down to the village level. And there are more programs that we're working to map down to the village level. But understanding the interactions between these is really important. Right? It's critically important for thinking about how to design efficient and effective service provision right, for poor populations in rural areas, how to mainstream those populations into the rest of India. It's also critically important for understanding from a program evaluation perspective what have these programs done, right? what have these schemes done to affect socioeconomic and political outcomes. Because without understanding the multiple different programs, being able to assess the extent to which there are interactions between them, right, we're not going to be able to understand what the treatments have been. And if we don't know what the treatments have been with great accuracy, then we can't assess outcomes and impacts. So one way to, to kind of summarize that is to say that there's a great amount of potential from an academic and policy perspective in evaluating these programs, but that doing so requires an integrated view. 
And that's what we're pushing towards with this project. There's also the great potential from just analyzing the rollout process, right? I showed you some examples from USAF phase one and PMGSY, where there are clear relationships between completion rates and challenges to implementation and the socio-demographic characteristics of villages and districts. Right? And so what that tells us is that there may be important economies of scale and efficiencies to be gained from better understanding where and when these projects can most effectively be implemented. So next steps. Uh, obviously, we're social scientists. We like more data. It's nice. We're going to work on that. Um, there are also ongoing coding efforts where with a number of programs we're trying to geolocate them down more precisely. Right? So completing the linking of PMGSY projects to villages, building out the geolocation of IAP programs, things like that. But there are also some analytical next steps. Right? So the first one and the one that we're working on now is a further analysis of completion patterns and interactions. Right? What I've shown you today in terms of analysis falls far short of what we would want for kind of serious academic research. Uh, but it's designed to show the potential of analyzing these data. The second next step is we, we want to engage in some reality checks of the data. Because what we have is administratively collected data built by people who are running programs and who potentially had something to gain in hopefully isolated incidents from reporting spending where things weren't actually built on the ground or where they weren't durably built. Right? And so one way to benchmark that is to compare the data that we have on what was built between 2001 and 2011 and the data from the 2011 village uh, census. And so we will, uh, we will hope to be able to do that soon. Second reality check is to compare the completion of RGGBY projects with changes in nighttime illumination. And people have done some work on this and it suggests that the correlation is not as strong as we might like. But that requires further analysis in order to understand which of the electrification projects that show up in the administrative data reflect the actual provision of electricity to villages. The third thing that we need to do is we need to really test what, what, what we would call the first stage. Right? What we would think of as the extent to which the allocation algorithms, which were built into the program documents and which the programs were supposed to follow, were actually followed. And then whether those implementation criteria were such that we're able to use instrumental variables or regression discontinuity approaches to understand the causal impact of these programs. Right? Because what we need to figure out always when we're thinking about program implementation is what would have happened had the program not been put in place. Right? And whether or not the criteria to use for these programs allow us to establish those counterfactuals with confidence is something that we're going to be looking into this fall. If they do, we will then be able to investigate the socioeconomic impacts of these programs at the village level, or at least we'll be able to do so as soon as uh, our colleagues release the 2012 to 13 economic census data. Um, finally, once that impact evaluation is done, we're going to make the data that we've developed with IGC's support uh, on, uh, available to other scholars and also provide statewide infrastructure program overviews that other researchers can use as a reference. And so we're going to build out a scholarly resource for others to use that will make it so that no one else needs to eat the sunk cost that we've eaten so far in developing these data. And we hope that will prove to be a useful resource. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll shift to questions. I think uh, we're going to have me on Skype here in a minute so that I can take your questions live. And I look forward to talking. Thank you. to thank uh, Professor Shapiro for that uh, uh, very interesting presentation. I'm very impressed, I think, by the sweep of, of and the breadth of uh, the coverage. Um, so it's a very ambitious program and some very valuable insights uh, for policymakers, I believe. And, uh, let's hear from uh, 
Dr. Chawla. Uh, Dr. Chawla, you have 10 minutes to uh, discuss the paper. No, please. Uh, I think it's. <laughs> Uh, more concerning issues that came up. Yes. Uh, in the research. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shapiro. That was a very uh, engaging uh, presentation. And I would say this is a, a brilliant conception of what Jonathan said is a co generation project where implementation of programs and applied research can go together to reveal so much. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned, it's still work in progress. I would say it is very, very ambitious, but also highly relevant from a policy point of view. Uh, just one or two quick comments on identification of programs. I mean, as we saw, there were two kinds of programs. Uh, one are sectoral programs, which uh, target outcomes in a particular sector. And then there are like catch-all programs, gap fillers, which uh, the choice lies with the local authorities and they can actually spend money across sectors. Uh, the task becomes a little more difficult because both sectoral programs and gap filling programs have some counterparts at the state level. So if the central government launches a rural connectivity program, uh, the state governments, because they find habitations are not connected, they also kind of uh, complement with their own version. So one, I mean, I mean, of course, the, so one has to be like, you know, just be sure that these verticals are rightly connected. Then importance of data framework and MIS design is very prominently brought out by this work. And this is probably a lesson for us, uh, that when we implement such ambitious programs, how the MIS should be designed to enable uh, applied work of this kind is critical. And that dialogue uh, right at, uh, at an implementation stage or an early stage is uh, worth it. And of course, a very good point, make, make that data available to researchers freely. And you know, as we create more and more PhD positions in uh, our universities, we should also be uh, moving and making the task easier. And that helps both uh, the researchers and the policymakers. This is a brilliant example of how to understand the implementation of government programs and how to relate them with demographic, geographic, and political uh, factors. And smiley, because I think that was very nicely done, what we saw about the US uh, Universal Service Obligation Fund and about PMGSY was uh, greatly revealing. Uh, this, of course, will go into the second stage because I had only seen uh, the shorter version of the slides I'll just make uh, one quick last comment that identifying socioeconomic outcomes and linking it to programs like this can be fascinating work. Uh, for example, connectivity of three kinds, R road connectivity, power connectivity, communication connectivity. If we identify a smaller area, a smaller district or part of it and see how these connectivities roll in at different points in time related to socioeconomic effects, I think we can identify and produce uh, great results. So my best wishes. It's a long, ambitious project. It's very exciting. And I hope next time we see it, we'll start jumping on our feet. Thank you. Uh. Let me open the, uh, uh, this uh, session to the floor now. And um, 
you may ask questions. We have uh, 10 minutes again. So I will take three questions from my left and then move to the right. Uh, <clears throat> can we do that, please? Without uh, showing any bias uh, about being left or right. <laughs> And could, could we also, could we ask that people please introduce themselves? Yes, since, yes. Since they, please you. introduce yourselves, uh, state your name and introduce yourself. Okay, I'll set, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've set the ball rolling. Dilip <clears throat> Mukherjee. Um, two questions. Uh, one is related to what Anamish just raised. The state supplements gaps. How does that cloud your you, would you be ha gathering data as well on you know, what the state is subsequently doing or local government is doing? And the other question is, uh, seems to be a broad issue is the relationship between centralization and decentralization in terms of the implementation of these programs. And I think one of the most striking facts is that you, uh, your work shows so far is seems to be a very limited coordination across these schemes. So one benefit of turning over these program implementations to state governments or local governments is better coordination. Now, would your exercise be able to throw any light on that question? I mean, the usual trade-offs there are that you could get better coordination if it's locally managed, but there's potential loss of economies of scale and even jurisdictional externalities. So, it seems to be very challenging to be able to get at some of those aspects. But the question is, you know, do you think that there's any scope for it? Yeah, so so let me let me take a, a stab at, at the first question and then ask Oliver to comment on that for a minute. Uh, and then and then I'll kind of and then we can answer quickly the second. Um, on on collecting the data on the state supplements. We're, we're going to be doing that where we can. Um, that's a, it's a slightly longer process, right? Because you multiply the number of programs or uh, officials we need to talk to by the number of states, right? And so um, we've got a kind of prioritization of states based on places where there's some uh, political instability due to left-wing extremism, where we're going to try and do that first. Uh, so it's on the agenda. But it's, you know, as I'm sure you can uh, appreciate, uh, very, even more time consuming than, than what we've done so far. Maybe Oliver, if you have other thoughts on that. Also because the, the information systems in the, in the states, and there are, there are like notable exceptions, but I think our general impression is that they are less well maintained than the ones that, that came under the, the Bar of Miramont program. I think one of the big achievements of these flagship programs was that there was at least a concerted effort to monitor like whatever work was being carried out and the extent to which that happened for the state level programs really differs uh, from, from state to state. And that's another channel. I think, I mean, we'll need, we'll need to accept that for some states will never be able to really monitor the, the kind of infrastructure from construction activity that has taken place over the last 10 to 20 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we can take uh, uh, three questions and then uh, Professor Shapiro can uh, respond. Sorry uh, about that. No, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you're most welcome. Yes. Uh, can we continue? Uh, my name is Ganesh. I'm a media student. And, uh, uh, my question is about the, the policies. The, there is a distinction between the, the policies. The, the first part is the targeted policies, and the other is the universal policies. As far as the targeted policies are concerned, the, the, these are like sudden electricity part, uh, electricity, road, and water. Is the political tool in India? So, have you studied the the impact of polit politics on the progress of these policies? Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, can we have... Uh... Um, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a really uh, uh, moving presentation and uh, can congratulations. Please, uh, uh, this is uh, Shekhar Ambati. I'm the regional head of uh, Edo Action International South Asia, looking after irrigation projects in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. Uh, connecting rural India. Uh, whenever you see the India map straight away, um, Professor uh, Sapiro, that everybody looks at Gujarat because Mr. Modi comes from there. And I keep on looking at all the slides, but Gujarat is not coming. So is it an omission or you are not able to collect the data? That's the first question. And just adding to that, uh, coming from the developmental background, I see uh, adding on to the gentleman here, not only the coordination, the communication, the another magic 3C is missing is the collaboration. And I was actually expecting Mr. Modi to come up with the ministry for Minister of Convergence as well. So would you be able to actually go to the extent of and coming with some recommendation that how these magic 3Cs, communication, collaboration, coordination, can be converged with the 4C and then these programs can be better implemented further. Thank you. Any other question? Um, oh, questions? At the back. Hi. I'm Praveena. Um, I see that I would like to know what is the context of the project. I see enough data, I see enough list of programs being looked at. And it's very specifically numbers, I understand it's a very data-centric program, but I also believe contexts are very important, be it political, social, and a bit of ethnography will also do justice to the data program. So uh, how have you gone about it? Have you thought about it? I do understand this project is in its initial phases. Okay. So I'll give um, it back to you, uh, Professor Shapiro. Okay, um, let me start by the, the first question on the studying the impact of politics on the programming. Uh, that's absolutely something we're interested in. It's not something we've done yet because we're still at the uh, stage of building data. Uh, but by, by trying to locate the projects down to the lowest possible geospatial level, we'll be able to combine them with a bunch of different uh, ways of measuring political variables. And so we'll be able to do that in the future. Uh, there's a whole set of challenges to doing that um, that we'll have to deal with, but that's, that's on the agenda once the, the data are, uh, are constructed. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave um, uh, Shakira, I'll leave you, your questions to, to Dr. Uh, Van uh, I wanted to address the last question of what the context is for this. So, um, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, India is uh, remarkable for the extent of the investment in these programs and also for the diversity of the political context in which they're taking place, right? And one of the things that comes up again and again when you look at the micro level at development activities uh, in places where there's um, uh, where there are different varieties of political orders, is the same kinds of programs work very differently in different places. Right? So, for example, in work I've done in Colombia, we see dramatically different uh, impacts from programs that are intended to build infrastructure for agricultural production at the rural level uh, in the northern part of the country which is uh, very secure and has been politically stable for a long time, versus uh, the central part of the country in the Amazon River area basin, where it's only in the last two or three years that the government has exercised kind of uncontested control. And so political institutions just aren't formed. And so a program that's ostensibly about development plays out completely differently in these two contexts. And so if you think about the you know, kind of massive diversity of politics in India, you might expect the same thing to, to, to occur. An implication of that, if it's true, is that the efficient allocation of development resources 
might be something very different than doing things equally and under the same criteria in every place. And so we'd like to start to understand the extent to which the different programs are working differently in different places. And in order to do that, we need to start with the data. And then once we have the data, we start to then work place by place to understand the differences in the political context and then test for differences in how the programs are working. So we're, we're extremely sensitive to context. And in fact, the differences due to context are a prime subject of study for us. Yeah, so let me just add to that that, I mean, we, we are, of course, constrained by what is already possibly an overambitious uh, uh, project. But I think the one ethno ethnography that we do carry out, like very uh, kind of with, with a lot of, 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 of effort, is that we, we really kind of we went and, and visited uh, with, with our, our amazing team in Korea all of the state capitals, and we actually talked to um, all the people who were implementing these projects in the different states. And that in itself gave us, I mean, it's not as good as actually doing a, a, a range of field visits, uh, I mean, arguably, but at least it gave us a lot of exposure to the differences in the implementation environment um, between the different states. Um, I'll take the, the remaining questions. So I think I still owe an answer to the second uh, question of, of, of Dilip um, about centralization and decentralization. So I think this is something that, that's, that's, this is a very interesting aspect of these programs. Um, even though the flagship programs, there the criteria were actually, at least in theory, the criteria were so strict that the ability for the states to actually coordinate uh, between the programs was actually hugely restricted. And our understanding is that unless they were willing to deviate from the, um, the kind of the centrally imposed guidelines, there was really no scope for such coordination. And we, we asked this question to all the people we've met in all of the, the offices that, that we've been to in, 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 in more than 20 states. And the answer that, the, the, if there's one consistent answer that we get in this project, it's that there's almost no coordination between these big flagship programs for infrastructure. However, I think if there's one kind of counterfactual for this particular kind of um, uh, institutional setup for infrastructure provision, it's probably in these uh, catch-all uh, programs that are a lot more flexible um, and that are not necessarily much different in terms of scale because they are also rolled out at a village level. So that would include a program like IEP. And IEP exactly kind of puts no restriction on the type of infrastructure that's being provided. So it really allows the district collector to kind of balance development needs and think carefully about potential complementarities, both in the construction stage and in the service provision stage. And I mean, I think, I think that comparison uh, would be, is something that we, we would be very, very much interested in. Um, I think I, there's one question that, I, that we still haven't answered, which is about um, Gujarat. Uh, actually, Gujarat uh, is, is on all of our maps, um, except those on which we, we, we zoom in. But given that we have 600,000 villages in India and, and hundreds of, of, uh, of thousands of, of, of project data, you really need to zoom, zoom in just to visualize these, uh, these data. But Gujarat is, is, uh, is, is part of this study. Um, let, let me add one, one, one last comment on, on uh, uh, Professor Mufriji's question, which is that the, the extent of the adjustment in the flexible programs to what the national level programs are doing is something that we can test or will be able to test once we're, once we're done. And so one of the priorities for the next uh, month or so is to build that data on, on IEP and the other flexible programs so we can start to do those diagnostics. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we uh, move to this side? Uh, 
Yes, please. I am T. N. Srinivasan from Yale University. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. I have a, one question relating to the issue of coordination. It seems to me there are two possibilities. One is coordinated road to heaven, and the other is the coordinated road to hell. And this, which you happen to take, depends upon exante design of the location of the projects which you are trying to coordinate. It seems to me, unless there is a prior consultation before the projects are rolled out, where they are going to be located, involving at least the administrative budget, knowledge, political and choosing the location, we, may not, we cannot expect very much from, from exposed analysis to the coordination. One point. The other uh, is the question. I see a lot of economic identity. yet what the particular Thanks for a very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, my name is Misha. I'm a security risk analyst at Orcash. Uh, my question to you, because the nature of my work is uh, that you spoke about the delay and difficulty of implementation of projects in areas where uh, ethnic minorities uh, exist. Uh, with regard to that, you also mentioned the influence of left-wing extremism. Uh, can you just open up about how you plan to check the correlation there what, and ensure that it's not? It, it's also causation, not just that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good morning. My name is Sanchita Bakshi. I work in the Planning Commission. Um, I must begin by thanking you for, for such an amazing presentation. It's really been uh, very, very illuminating to be here, and I look forward to the times when this data would be available for uh, you know wider use in research. Um, my question to you is. Um, I was very intrigued when you were presenting the implementation of these programs in areas which are SD dominated. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that your geographical unit of analysis in these places is villages. Um, one of the distinctive features of you know, the spatial spread of the STs in India is that STs, if you look at ST dominated districts, for instance, where the average population of ST is more than the India's average. They, these ST dominated districts are mostly in, are, are either hilly districts, are forested districts, or are what are called dryland districts. Uh, there's a very, you know, there's a very high overlap of ST areas with these districts. So these are very difficult areas to work in already. I mean, these are what economists would call low potential areas because these are difficult geographies, etc. I'm just wondering how much of this like factors in the implementation of these programs because these are not, you know, like uh, otherwise what a district would be like. These are difficult areas to be working in already. So just how much of that factors in, in the implementation? Okay. You. Can you move the give yeah, the mic? Yeah. Uh, I'm Ashwini Kulkarni from an NGO called Pragati Abhiyan working in Maharashtra. Uh, what I would like to know is these are different projects and the process of decision making of uptake as well as where it will be located is dependent on the way it is uh, decision making is processed. Like for example, if you take the water, uh, drinking water project, is the Gram Panchayat who is supposed to apply? Or if there is this uh, uh, tower, then it's the service provider who uh, takes the initiative. So this process of who 
has to take the initiative will uh, influence a lot on the uptake as well as the location where it gets uh, implemented. So how, how are you looking at these different implementation processes and its influence on its implementation? Okay, uh, let me give it back to Professor Shapiro, uh, but uh, we really have run out of time. So I just wanted to remind you of that and okay. we know how late it is at your end. I, I, will, I will then be very, very quick and just, uh, I just want to make uh, kind of three quick points to, to close and pull these questions together. The first is the, the last question uh, really tied into the first question about how will we identify econometrically what's going on here. And for each, each program, there is a different official criteria, which at least it appears to, to have been met. And in terms of what places got the projects, and each program had different criteria. And so what that means is that there's a different progression discontinuity design that is appropriate for each program. Now, there's also an endogenous component to each program, which is, uh, which is reflected in the regression, which is the timing of the actual rollout of the program. So among the set of places that meet the criteria, right, local officials had a fair amount of scope to choose when things were done. And so that's both a challenge to econometrically identifying the net impact of the program and an opportunity for understanding the politics of the implementation. So uh, it's exactly those differences that make identification possible. Um, with respect to kind of the, the, the presence of, of scheduled tribes and left-wing extremism and also the, the geographic differences, the first thing to say is uh, what we've shown you so far could reflect the other correlates of scheduled tribe presence and not necessarily scheduled tribe presence in itself. And that's something we need to do much more work econometrically to parse out how much of it is the presence of ethnic minorities versus the things that correlate with the presence of ethnic minorities. Um, where this becomes uh, really important is when you think about how the presence of ethnic minorities or left-wing extremism would affect the ability to complete projects. Um, you need to understand what, uh, what parts of those presence, of that presence is varying for reasons independent of the rollout of these various projects, right? And uh, that's a tricky thing and we need to understand a little bit more about how uh, ST presence and the presence of left-wing extremism influence the phasing of rollout at the state level in order to answer that question. Uh, that's a challenge that we're very much aware of and uh, hope to address as we move towards the analytical phase of the project uh, and move out of the data collection phase later this year. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Shapiro um, and your colleague there. I, we really want to thank you for participating at this uh, unearthly hour at your end. Um, and it was indeed a fascinating presentation. Um, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed it as much as we all did here. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So we now move on to the uh, next presentation on pollution externalities and health. Um, and uh, the research is done on uh, the rivers of India. Um, and the presentation will be made by uh, Sam Stolper. Um, Sam, why don't you maybe take the podium?
people hear me better now? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, this is joint work with uh, Kui Tuan Do at the World Bank and Shireen Joshi at Georgetown. Um, and let me start by pointing out a very recent New York Times article. This is from three days ago. The title of the article is Poor Sanitation in India May Afflict Well-Fed Children with Malnutrition. So this is for motivation's sake. Um, this article is discussing on the one hand um, malnutrition, which remains stubbornly high in India despite rapid economic growth in recent years. Um, and on the other hand, sanitation, which perhaps remains stubbornly low or incomplete um, uh, in India. And so there's a hypothesis floating around, and which is discussed in this article, um, that uh, sanitation uh, could explain something like stubbornly high malnutrition, or as well something like uh, child or infant mortality, which is also remains high in spite of improvements. I actually just read, um, uh, for comparison's sake, this is a New York Times article, but the Hindustani Times that showed up on my hotel door this morning had a graphic on child mortality remaining high in India. So um, there's a hypothesis out there that sanitation um, can explain this. Um, and in particular, one of the channels that through which sanitation may adversely affect health is water quality. Water and sanitation go hand in hand. Um, so I've cherry picked a few quotes from this article that I won't read out loud in the interest of time, but they, to, the, the, the notion is that there's a huge gap between sewage load and the capacity to treat sewage in India. So we end up with uh, raw, untreated sewage flowing into Indian rivers. Um, and these rivers are not just culturally, religiously significant, but also they're a major source of water use across India. Okay, so that's where our research agenda gets some of its motivation. We want to try and understand what the health impacts of water quality and sanitation shortcomings um, actually are. So there's two questions of note for this particular project that we're looking at right now. The first is what impact does water pollution in a district have on health outcomes in that district? That's the classic negative externality of pollution. Pollution is not priced at the full social cost, so we do too much of it. And there's an external health cost or other sorts of external costs that are borne by the, the surrounding community, not just the private polluter. Secondarily, um, and still important, is does the question of does the health impact persist downstream? Okay, in the case of rivers, um, pollution is measured in one place, is produced in one place, it flows downstream and could possibly have further additional external health costs down there. Um, and that begs other difficult questions about um, sort of bargaining and interacting across districts to come at, get the right policy to sort of fix these pollution problems. Um, so as you might imagine, our context is Indian rivers. Um, we're focusing on domestic water pollution. And, uh, and our key outcome variable for the time being is infant mortality. The strategy is econometric. Um, in particular, we're going to use instrumental variables regression to combat the classic problem of omitted variable bias. Okay, pollution is not randomly assigned. Um, and we have to be careful lest we spuriously link water pollution to uh, health in some way that is biased upwards or biased downwards. So I'll explain the, the instrument um, in a few slides in the methods section, but for now know that we are going to try and utilize uh, water pollution that flows from upstream, that is produced or measured upstream, so that the decision to pollute is sort of independent of downstream drivers of pollution and health. Um, but still flows downstream um, and subject to some decay, remains downstream to impart a health impact. We use the IV, the instrumental variables, two-stage least squares analysis to answer the first question, the within district externality. And we use the reduced form, a comparison of upstream pollution with downstream uh, health impacts to try and answer the second question about persistent <laughs> downstream impacts. Okay, so a little literature and background in India. Um, the epidemiology literature has a long history of uh, uh, studying water use uh, and mortality. It goes way back to 1849. John Snow, some people consider to be the founder of uh, public health as a field, as a discipline. And he studied in 1849 um, the London cholera epidemic. 
saying, arguing that the cause was sewage in the form of fecal bacteria leaking into a public well. That's remarkably similar to the context that I'm presenting here today. We're studying rivers, but it's sewage in the form, and it's being measured in our case by fecal coliform concentrations. Um, and we're trying to see, investigate the health impacts. Since John Snow in 1849, there's been a lot of other work. Uh, so we now know that it's not just drinking water, but, there are, but also several other possible channels through which water quality can adversely impact health, such as irrigation, bathing, food prep and consumption, person-to-person -person contact. Okay, we also have some idea of the pathogens and the diseases and illnesses that are associated with uh, domestic water pollution. There's an economics literature as well. Um, it's a lot briefer, but it's dense. Um, first, people began studying air pollution and health, but we've uh, moved on to expand into, into water pollution as well. Okay, there's a lot of work here. I'm sort of uh, highlighting three subsets of this literature. The first is generally on the causal impacts of water pollution on health, and there's a lot here of work uh, that has a program evaluation flavor to it. We study um, investments, interventions, policies to improve uh, water provision or, uh, or quality um, and try and link that directly to health impacts, suggesting that the mechanism is improved water quality. Um, there's a lot less, uh, there's a lot fewer studies, they are fewer and farther between that link directly water quality to health. That's something that we're doing. We're not investigating an intervention in particular so much as the current levels and changes on baseline levels of water quality and what that does to health. Um, secondly, there's uh, a literature on water pollution specifically in India that gives us a lot of evidence of a, a very real willingness to pay um, associated with a very real cost of illness of river water pollution um, uh, in Indian rivers. And thirdly, um, there's a regional pollution spillovers literature that's relevant and to which we want to contribute um, that shows theory that sort of hashes out the theory um, on how upstream of administrative borders you might see free riding by governments, by populations, that is to say heightened water pollution just upstream of borders because once that water pollution clears the border it's in a different jurisdiction and it's not uh, the upstream communities problem. Um, so empirically there's work to match this. Um, what we would like to do is add uh, some sort of estimate of the health cost um, to this literature. There's even more to talk about in the Indian context. I'm not going to do it anywhere near full justice, but I want to highlight two points um, uh, that I think are particularly relevant. The first is on this, on the sewage treatment gap that I, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, the Central Pollution Control Board, the CPCB, reports on its website um, that this is, you know, these numbers are rising, you know, every day probably, but as of uh, this being put on the website in 2013, the total sewage burden in all cities greater than 50,000 people um, was 29,000 million liters per day, MLD. Meanwhile, installed treatment capacity in uh, those same cities is 6,000 MLD. So the shortfall is 21,000 MLD or 73% of the total burden. I met with somebody at the CPCB yesterday and uh, he said that that gap is widening. Okay, we're, we're, it, we're having trouble keeping pace with population growth and with consumption growth. Um, so there's a very real sewage problem here. The sewage is going into rivers um, among other places, among other water sources. Um, the second point is that the government knows this. It's known this for a while um, and has, among other, through, among other policies, been trying to combat that with the National River Conservation Plan, NRCP, uh, for, for several decades. Starting in 1986, the Ganga Action Plan um, was uh, aimed at improving water quality um, uh, domestic, uh, as pertains to domestic water pollution uh, in the Ganga River. It was expanded to the Ganga Basin, and then in the mid-90s to rivers all across India. Um, to my reading, you guys can correct me if you, or, or, or say, give a different perspective, but to my reading, this is the flagship river cleanup policy in India, or series of policies, if you will. Um, the target for water quality is bathing class standard, which um, is defined by a rubric created by the government, 
um, based on uh, standards for particular pollutants. And the way that we are to attain that target is through interception, diversion, and treatment of sewage. So this is, this is a water quality policy, but it's a sanitation policy, too. Um, uh, it's hard to get a read on the exact expenditure. This is my best guess. 80 billion US dollars in three decades. Depends, depending on your perspective, that could be a lot or it could be very little. Um, uh, but the point is, there's been some expenditure. There's been a significant sort of commitment over time to uh, improving water quality in rivers. And nonetheless, in spite of that, I know of no robust evidence or argument um, for NRCP actually making a difference in water quality of Indian rivers. Um, and full disclosure, this paper I cite here by Michael Greenstone and Rima Hanna, um, I was a research assistant on. Um, uh, they study uh, the effect of a variety of air and water pollution uh, policies on health and on air and water quality itself. Um, and they find no significant impact of NRCP. Okay, so we have a, a significant sewage problem and a policy that may or may not be working. Um, all right, so that's the backdrop uh, against which um, we conduct this study. Onto the methods now. This is econometrics um, at its base, at its foundation, and so it relies.